and welcome. It's my pleasure today to host this interview with Dr. Philip McMillan. Welcome, Philip. Hi, how are you? Do you mind if I call you Jackie? That's fine. <laughs> yes, thank you for having me. And thank you for hosting me, Jackie, because usually I am hosting someone else. So I don't get to talk about some of the things that I would normally want to share. That's right. So we're very keen today to learn more and understand what exactly is autoimmunity and COVID-19. Mm, yes, yes. And for those who don't as yet know me, because um, uh, I usually am doing a LinkedIn live show interviewing people, but I am fundamentally a physician. So I'm a clinician. I work in hospital medicine. I deal with sick patients. Um, I have been looking at autoimmunity in COVID-19. And prior to that, I've been researching dementia with a unique approach. And just at the point of almost solving the disease, we came across COVID-19. So my approach I then took to look at COVID-19. And this is where it has led me. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could tell us a bit about this approach to research. Does it involve any lab work? No, not at all. So I don't at all deal with the lab. As I said, I'm purely a clinician. And so my focus is primarily around patients and looking at research in relation to clinical medicine. So what I would do is I will take research that has been done sometimes up to 30 years ago, look at the relevance of it in a clinical context, especially when you're trying to find an answer for a disease. What I try and do is look always for primary pathophysiology. And that means you're looking to find the primary cause that causes the disease because you can't make any progress until that has been done. Could you break that down a little bit for us? Uh patho, so pathology and then physiology, what, what are those two things? Yeah, so pathology is about the study of the causes of disease. So there we are looking at the, the changes that happen in disease, as opposed to physiology, which is about the normal function of the body without the disease. And so the pathology impacts the physiology, and you're looking at it to try and see if you can get a handle of what's going on. So that's how I tend to look at it. Okay, thank you. And what about COVID-19 then? What have you seen there that makes you think this is different from other normal viruses? Yeah, so as I said, in, in order to understand the disease, you have to, to step back sometimes and take a look at some of the patterns that are there in terms of the disease. So one of the things that I noticed with regards to COVID-19 when I started researching in February 2020 is that I looked at the fact that newborns weren't affected. That to me was a big question because in all infections, viral infections included, the newborns are, are immunosuppressed or not immunosuppressed. They just don't have a good immune system. And so do the elderly. So usually you see a U-shaped curve where the very young uh, die and the very old die. We didn't see that at all early on in COVID-19. And additionally, when the first bit of research came out, I thought to myself, 76% of the hospital admissions had hypertension. I cannot think of a viral disease where hypertension is the target. And so that stood out as well for me as being something that was unusual. Mm -hmm, quite unusual, yes. And um, why do you refer to yourself as a lead researcher in COVID-19 and autoimmunity specifically? Yeah, well, <laughs> As what happens for anybody who does research, when, you, when you're doing research and you, you're synthesizing it and you're reflecting on it and you're, you're mulling it over in your mind, there comes a point where it takes a quantum leap. And in my case, that happened in about April 2020, where the research just took a jump and I saw straight away, this is autoimmunity. And I was the first person to document that thought and the first person to then lead the, the, the field almost with regards to autoimmunity, because at that time it seemed strange. And even now talking to clinicians and scientists, it still seems like a strange concept to be talking about autoimmunity in a viral infection. And so since then, um, we've published uh, two papers. 
Um, the second one is almost about to, to be published. So I should say it's not published yet. Um, and um, I have been banging this drum now for almost a year about autoimmunity. That's primarily why I see myself as the lead. I have consistently maintained that point about autoimmunity in COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And your work, your, through your work, you're continuing to raise awareness of autoimmunity in COVID-19 and put forward the idea. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's my aim until we accept it one way or the other, or right. it's proven wrong. Okay. Well, could you take a step back and tell us then what is an autoimmune disease for those who don't know? Yeah. Do you mind if I, I share with you a, a couple of slides, so to that speak? That would be quite helpful, yes. Yeah. So I'll, I'll share a couple of slides that will hopefully try and make it a little bit simpler for people to understand. Uh, the first thing is that a viral mediated autoimmune disease is not uncommon. So I've got here a picture of some of the diseases, not all. So um, multiple sclerosis, um, and in black, you have the disease, and underneath, you have the, the virus that caused it. In this one, it could have been Epstein-Barr, it could be CMV, or it could be varicella zoster. Um, type 1 diabetes is sometimes affected by Coxsackie virus, rotavirus. Rheumatoid arthritis, again, could be Epstein-Barr. So this is a pattern that occurs in many, many viral diseases. And so the concept of a viral-mediated autoimmune disease is not strange. And so that's a very, very important point that I wanted to try and, and make. The question is beyond that, how does it fit with regards to COVID-19? And that was the other part of the question that I had. And as I mentioned before, when we looked at hospitalization, I saw that there was clearly a a, a, a link with regards to not just age, but some racial groups and particularly cardiovascular disease, hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, and in young people, especially obesity. That did not fit at all with any kind of viral infection. You know, so th this is what I'm saying is that very early in March, you started to see patterns that didn't quite fit with regards to uh, a, a viral infection. And so it was important for me to try and get to what I call, which is primary pathophysiology. Mm -hmm. And in that research, I started with the simple question about how did the virus get into the body? And that was the ACE2 receptor. And for those who need to understand a little bit of biology, just to simplify it, you have here the virus, and the virus tends to have about 15 spike proteins on it. And the spike proteins are where it binds to a receptor to go inside the cell. Because a virus is different from a bacteria in that the virus cannot replicate unless it's inside a cell. So it uses the ACE2 receptor as the entry protein to go inside the cell and then replicate. And that's simply it. In the original SARS in 2003, it also used ACE2. And in the MERS infection, it used another receptor called DPP4. And so that's a pattern with regards to the coronaviruses that have been affecting humankind for this period of time. So mm -hmm. ACE2 was the critical piece of the puzzle. Now, at the time, I needed to understand what was the difference with people who had cardiovascular disease. What was it that was different about them that children didn't have? And that's what caused me to start searching for something that was different. And in that process, this is where I came to the concept of serum ACE2. Now, uh, what can I say? I didn't know about it either. So I can't say that I knew about serum ACE2 before last year when I started to look at it. And to me, it is the key point with regards to being able to grasp autoimmunity, all right? So what happens is that the ACE2 enzyme is normally attached to a cell. So the virus can bind to it and use this to get inside the cell and then it can replicate. But for some reason in certain diseases, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, hypertension, the body uses a special enzyme to clip the ACE2 and it floats in the serum. 
And the only thing I can say is that we don't fully understand the reason why, but it seems as though this is about balancing the effect of aldosterone levels in the bloodstream. And everything in the body is about balance. And so in the same way that ACE2 balances the effects of ACE, that's angiotensin converting enzyme, another similar enzyme, by balancing angiotensin 2, the serum levels of ACE2 seem to balance something else. And so the body is always doing these balances and counterbalances all the time. And in the context of cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, the serum ACE2 levels rise. So it led me to a very simple question. What impact does that have on the virus? That was, mm, that was effectively it. That was what led me to it. I, I thought, well, if you have higher levels of serum ACE2 and the virus uses and binds to ACE2, what happens if the virus binds to the serum ACE2? That, that was really the question. And at the time, there was a consideration to use serum ACE2 as a therapeutic to try and prevent the virus from being able to bind. And so we thought that if you if you injected um, um, recombinant ACE2, it would bind to the virus and stop it from, from infecting other cells. So it, it was just a simple question that led me to this thought about autoimmunity. I needed to understand what would happen if the serum ACE2 bound to the virus. And that's where it led me to that principle. Now, all I can say is that it's important to understand just how important serum ACE2 is. And um, it's probably going to be one of the most important um, breakthroughs we've had um, in the past 10 years. So this was from a study in the Lancelet um, just in October last year. So they were doing this study over a number of years, looking at comorbidities. And what they found was that the levels of serum or plasma ACE2 were higher in males. So it, sex was the most important determining factor. Ancestry or genetics, East Asians and Africans. And weight, obesity. Diabetes, age, and blood pressure were also contributing factors. And this, to me, stood out as probably one of the most important things to look at. The, the same people who seem to have a higher risk of infection also had higher mm -hmm. levels of serum ACE2. And that's what stood out to me at the time before the, the, the thought of autoimmunity came. I was trying to work out what was it with this group of people who had all of these um, characteristics. Why was it that the virus was having more of an impact on them? And I, I couldn't understand it at the time. Right, thank you for that. Is there any other research on this topic? Well, um, there is quite a bit of research. We, when we were looking at doing the research ourselves in about June last year, we wanted to look um, for autoantibodies to ACE2. And the reason was because our thought was that if you had the virus binding to it, you would then have a higher risk of um, autoimmunity. So our thought was simple that if you had the virus binding to the spike protein, then you have here uh, a combination of the spike protein and the serum ACE2. When this gets taken up by the antigen presenting cell, and what these cells do is a white blood cell, they take a protein, they break it up into multiple small pieces, and then they make multiple little um, antigens for the body to react to and produce antibodies. And so in that context, my question was simple. Well, what happens when this antigen presenting cell um, eats this uh, combination of virus and ACE2, will it not make antibodies to the spike protein and ACE2? And that was effectively the thought that led it to the question of autoimmunity. 
was purely about how in the world is the, the antigen presenting cell going to be able to differentiate the two of them? Mm -hmm. Very interesting, thank you. Um, does this tie into symptoms um, that we see normally for patients with, with uh, COVID-19? Mm, absolutely, and um, it's something that probably, I, I guess in terms of the, the explanations, um, in order to explain the symptoms, you then have to understand the, the next step that we would predict happens or what happens essentially. So after the macrophage eats it, it will then stimulate multiple plasma B cells to produce antibodies. And if it's producing antibodies that are targeting ACE2, it will then hit the, the ACE2 on the endothelial cells in the blood vessels, especially in the lung. It will make complexes in the bloodstream and it will also target the virus. So you have all these antibodies being produced because as far as the body is concerned, it doesn't know the difference. It's thinking that this ACE2, this serum ACE2, is now a part of the virus. And that's effectively the thought, is that it's looking at serum ACE2 as being a part of the spike protein. And it would effectively, therefore, create antibodies to it as well. Mm -hmm. So this is the huge uh, immune response that the body mounts then. It's, mm -hmm. it's based on this reaction. Okay, thank you very yeah. much for that. Yeah, so um, how about the timeline of symptoms? Is there, does this tie, how does this tie into what we see there? Yes, well, this is this is one of the interesting things about the virus is when and we're looking at our third paper now to look at what we call the molecular steps to lead to autoimmunity. And in the third paper, what we're then trying to see if we can do is that we are then going to be taking on the the challenge of trying to see that step that occurs throughout the, um, the, the, the phases of the disease. The virus is able to avoid detection by the body in the first five days. So really, really important thing. From the point of infection to the point of initial symptoms is about at least earliest about three, but probably about five days. That's when people start to have things like a temperature, they feel a little bit achy and so on. But the virus based on animal studies has reached peak replication by about three days. So if the virus was going to be causing the symptoms, you would have symptoms very early, probably similar to what you see in an influenza um, or a cold. Within a day or two, you start having symptoms. You don't see that in COVID-19. When we look at the timeline of the disease, what you see is that at about day five after the infection, you start to get some of the symptoms but you don't end up in hospital until about day 12. You don't end up on ITU until about day 16. And in the context of a disease where it reaches peak viral replication at day three, that pattern doesn't make any sense. So it can't be the virus that's causing the shortness of breath. It must be something else. And that's where the principle of autoimmunity comes from, because it takes your body about seven days to start making antibodies. That's the IgM antibodies, the first ones that we produce. And so the IgM antibodies in the context of autoimmunity will then start to damage the lining of the blood vessels in the lungs. And as this damage increases, by about day 12, you start to feel short of breath. When you have a transition, but about day 11, where you have the production of IgG antibodies, so that's the long-term antibody that we normally see. So if you have IgG antibodies being produced at that point, the combination of the IgM and IgG then create very severe inflammation. And it leads to what we see in the pathology of microthrombi. So it damages the lining of the blood vessels in the lungs. The lung blood vessels then make more likely that they make little clots. These little clots then block the blood vessels in the lung. That's why people can't breathe. And that's the important piece of the puzzle with the timeline. The timeline for people to get into intensive care at, at day 16 
where we find a very low titers of the virus, it suggests that this is all about the immune system going offhand, which is, in my view, purely autoimmunity. Mm, thank you. So tell us how the theory of autoimmunity then can be applied to targeting and treatment of people with COVID-19. Well, this is a bit that is, is important. This is not just an academic point. So if it was just an academic point, you know, that there's no time frame about it. But this is far more than academics. Because what we have found so far is that the one of the, the two therapies that are approved and working are both immunosuppressants. And mm -hmm. If that's the case, one of the main one that we use is steroids, simple steroids. Who would have ever thought that steroids could work in a viral infection? It, it just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And so the point is, is that when we understand the disease, it helps us to know how to treat it. So the example would be, if we're looking at this, at, at, at say for instance, a systemic lupus, with lung involvement, and they've got severe inflammation in the lung. Um, or even uh, there's another condition we call good pasture syndrome, where there are antibodies and uh, white blood cells attacking the, the lining of the, the blood vessels in the lung. In order to treat that, you have to use very high dose immunosuppression. And so we are using a standard low dose steroid because we don't understand the disease. In some people, you would then need to use very high doses of steroids with other immunosuppressants in order to settle the, immune, the inflammation down. And that's why I'm concerned because I think we have all the tools we need. Mm -hmm. All the tools that are needed to treat severe patients are at our fingertips if we understand the disease. Mm -hmm. Yes, you've really made the point as to how important it is to understand the underlying cause, um, the mechanism by, it work, by which this disease works in order to be able to treat it properly. Very mm -hmm. important. Okay, well, um, do you have any further comments or, um, before we wrap up? Yeah, well, I think that one of the, the important points is that um, when we look at longer term issues with regards to COVID-19, and we've had uh, a lot of discussions recently. I, I'd recently spoken to, to Gert last week, and he has expressed concerns about vaccination in a pandemic. Um, I don't fully understand a lot of, of, of those theories, but I accept them. But here's the point that I would want people to take away, and certainly people who are in a position where they are impacting on the health of people. A simple question. If this disease is autoimmunity, are we likely to make that better or worse? Or does it have no impact in the context of vaccination? It's a very important question that we really have to think about. Mm -hmm. Secondly, based on this principle of elevated levels of serum ACE2, we can identify the people who are at highest risk of severe disease. When we give people therapies that they are not at risk for a disease with, we only increase the risk of complications without any clear benefits. Those are two big concerns that I have, which could be dealt with if we understand the pathophysiology of the disease. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think there's still many unanswered questions and one would hope that the research uh, continues so that we can better understand not just the short term, but also some long term impacts. If there are any, what are they? So thank you very much. Um, I do believe um, a presentation will be available on the Macmillan Research site and that's macmillanresearch.com um, shortly. And so there will be more details um, uh, to go with explaining this theory of autoimmunity um, available soon. So I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to explain and help us understand uh, a bit more about autoimmunity and COVID-19 and some of the implications. Very much appreciate your time.
Thank you very much for having me and hosting me, Jackie. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.